The Life and Adventures of Peter Wilkins, Volume 1. The Life and Adventures of Peter Wilkins, by Robert Paltick. Preface. In one of those bright racy essays at which modern dullness delights to sneer, Hazlitt discussed the question whether the desire of posthumous fame is a legitimate aspiration, and the conclusion at which he arrived was that there is something of egotism and even of pedantry in this sentiment. It is a true saying in literature as in morality that he that seeketh his life shall lose it. The world cares most for those who have cared least for the world's applause. A nameless minstrel of the North Country sings a ballad that shall stir men's hearts from age to age with haunting melody. Southey, toiling at his epics, is excluded from Parnassus. Some there are who have knocked at the door of the Temple of Fame, and have been admitted at once and forever. When Thucydides announced that he intended his history to be a possession for all time, there was no mistaking the tone of authority. But to be enthroned in state, to receive the homage of the admiring multitude, and then to be rejected as a pretender, that is indeed a sorry fate, and one that may well make us pause before envying literary despots their titles. The more closely a writer shrouds himself from view, the more eager are his readers to get a sight of him. The loss of an arm or a leg would be a slight price for a genuine student to pay, if only he could discover one new fact about Shakespeare's history. I will not attempt to impose on the reader's credulity by professing myself eager to acquire information about the author of Peter Wilkins at such a sacrifice but it would have been a sincere pleasure to me if I could have brought to light some particulars about one whose personality must have possessed a more than ordinary charm. The delightful Voyage Imaginaire, here presented to the reader, was first published in 1751. Footnote. Some copies are said to be dated 1750. It appears on the list of new books announced in the Gentleman's Magazine for November 1750. End of footnote. An edition appeared immediately afterwards at Dublin, so the book must have had some sale. The introduction and the dedication to the Countess of Northumberland, to whom it will be remembered Percy dedicated his relics and Goldsmith the first printed copy of his Edwin and Angelina, are signed with the initials R.P., and for many years the author's full name was unknown. In 1835, Nicole, the printer, sold by auction a number of books and manuscripts in his possession, which had once belonged to Dodsley, the publisher. And when these were being catalogued, the original agreement for the sale of the manuscript of Peter Wilkins was brought to light. Footnote. It is now in the collection, shortly to be dispersed, of the late Mr. James Crossley of Manchester, a gentleman who was esteemed throughout his long life, not less for unfailing courtesy than for rare scholarship. Mr. Crossley promised to search for the document and send me a transcript of it, but his kind intention was frustrated by his death. Paltock's name is sometimes written Pultock or Poltock. There is no ground for identifying the author of Peter Wilkins with the R.P. Gentleman, who published in 1751 Memoirs of the Life of Parnessa, a Spanish lady, translated from the Spanish manuscript. End of footnote. From this document, it appeared that the author was Robert Paltock of Clements Inn, and that he received for the copyright twenty pounds, twelve copies of the book, and the cuts of the first impression, proof impressions of the illustrations. The writer's name shows him to have been, like his hero, of Cornish origin but the authors of the admirable and exhaustive Bibliotheca Cornubiensis could discover nothing about him beyond the fact that he was not a bencher of Clement's Inn. That Paltick should have chosen Clement's Inn as a place of residence is not surprising. It still keeps something of its pristine repose. The sundial is still supported by the negro. The grass has not lost its verdure. And on August evenings, the plane tree's leaves glint golden in the sun. One may still hear the chimes at midnight, as Falstaff and Justice Shallow heard them of old. Here, where only a muffled murmur comes from the workaday world, a man in the last century might have dreamed away his life 
lonely as Peter Wilkins on the island. One can imagine the amiable recluse composing his homely romance amid such surroundings. Perhaps it was the one labor of his life. He may have come to the inn originally with the aspiration of making fame and money, and then the spirit of cloistered calm turned him from such vulgar paths, and, instead of losing his fine feelings and swelling the ranks of the plutocrats, he gave us a charming romance for our fireside. With the literary men of his day he seems to have had no intercourse. Not a single mention of him is to be found among his contemporaries, and we may be sure that he cut no brilliant figure at the clubhouses. No chorus of reviewers chimed the praises of Peter Wilkins. So far as I can discover, the monthly review was the only journal in which the book was noticed, and such criticism as the following can hardly be termed laudatory. Here is a very strange performance indeed. It seems to be the illegitimate offspring of no very natural conjunction, like Gulliver's Travels and Robinson Crusoe, but much inferior to the manner of these two performances as to entertainment or utility. It has all that is impossible in the one, or impossible in the other, without the wit and spirit of the first, or the just strokes of nature and useful lessons of morality in the second. However, if the invention of wings for mankind to fly with is sufficient amends for all the dullness and unmeaning extravagance of the author, we are willing to allow that his book has some merit, and that he deserves some encouragement, at least, as an able mechanic, if not as a good author. But the book was not forgotten. A new edition appeared in 1783, and again in the following year. It was included in Weber's Popular Romances, 1812, and published separately with some charming plates by Stothard in 1816. Within the last fifty years, it has been frequently issued, entire or mutilated, in a popular form. A drama founded on the romance was acted at Covent Garden on April 16, 1827, and more than once of late years, Peter Wilkins has afforded material for pantomimes. In 1763, a French translation by Philippe Florent de Puisseau appeared under the title of Les Hommes Volants ou les Aventures de Pierre Wilkins, which was included in volumes 22 to 23 of de Perth's Voyages Imaginaires, 1788 to 89. A German translation was published in 1767, having for title Die Fliegenden Menschen oder wunderbar begin behalten Peter Wilkins. Whether the author lived to see the translations of this work cannot be ascertained. A Robert Paltick was buried at Reem Intrinsica Church, Dorset, in 1767, aged 70. Hutchins Dorset, 4, 493-494, 3rd edition. But it is very doubtful whether he was the author of the romance. Paltick's fame may be said to be firmly established. An American writer, it is true, in a recent history of fiction, says not a word about Peter Wilkins. But we must remember, another American wrote a history of caricature without mentioning Rowlandson. Coleridge admired the book, and is reported to have said, Peter Wilkins is to my mind a work of uncommon beauty. I believe that Robinson Crusoe and Peter Wilkins could only have been written by islanders. No continentalist could have conceived either tale. It would require a very peculiar genius to add another tale, a justum generis, to Robinson Crusoe and Peter Wilkins. I once projected such a thing, but the difficulty of the preoccupied ground stopped me. Perhaps La Motte Fouquet might affect something but I should fear that neither he nor any other German could entirely understand what may be called the desert island feeling. I would try the marvelous line of Peter Wilkins if I attempted it rather than the real fiction of Robinson Crusoe. Table Talk, 1851, pages 331 to 332. Southey, in a note on a passage of The Curse of Kahama, went so far as to say that Paltuck's winged people are the most beautiful creatures of imagination that ever were devised, and added that Sir Walter Scott was a warm admirer of the book. With Charles Lamb at Christ's Hospital, 
the story was a favorite. We had classics of our own, he says, without being beholden to insolent Greece or haughty Rome that passed current among us. Peter Wilkins, The Adventures of the Honorable Captain Robert Boyle, The Fortunate Blue Coat Boy, and the like. But nobody loved the old romance with such devotion as Lee Hunt. He was never tired of discoursing about its beauties, and he wrote with such thorough appreciation of his subject that he left little or nothing for another to add. It is interesting, he writes in one place, to fancy R.P. or Mr. Robert Paltick of Clement's Inn, a gentle lover of books, not successful enough, perhaps, as a barrister to lead a public or profitable life, but eking out a little employment or a bit of a patrimony with literature congenial to him and looking oftener to purchase his pilgrims on his shelves than to coke on Littleton. We picture him to ourselves with Robinson Crusoe on one side of him and Guadentio di Luca on the other, hearing the pen go over his paper in one of those quiet rooms in Clement's Inn that look out of its old-fashioned buildings into the little garden with the dial in it held by the negro, one of the prettiest corners in London, and extremely fit for a sequestered fancy that cannot get any further. There he sits, the unknown, ingenious, and amiable Mr. Robert Paltick, thinking of an imaginary beauty for want of a better, and creating her for the delight of posterity, though his contemporaries were to know little or nothing of her. We shall never go through the place again without regarding him as its crowning interest. Now, a sweeter creature than Uwarki is not to be found in books, and she does him immortal honor. She is all tenderness and vivacity, all born good taste and blessed companionship. Her pleasure consists but in his. She prevents all his wishes, has neither prudery nor immodesty. Sheds not a tear but from right feeling, is the good of his home and the grace of his fancy. It has been well observed that the author has not made his flying women in general light and airy enough, and it may be said on the other hand that the kind of wing, the grandee or elastic drapery which opens and shuts at pleasure, however ingeniously and even beautifully contrived, would necessitate creatures whose modifications of humanity, bodily and mental, though never so good after their kind, might have startled the inventor had he been more of a naturalist, might have developed a being very different from the feminine, sympathizing, and lovely Uwarki. Muscles and nerves not human must have been associated with inhuman wants and feelings, probably have necessitated talons and a beak. At best, the woman would have been wilder, more elvish, capricious, and unaccountable, she would have ruffled her whalebones when angry, been horribly intimate, perhaps, with bird nests and fights with eagles, and frightened Wilkins out of his wits with dashing betwixt rocks and pulling the noses of seals and gulls. Book for a Corner, 1868, 1, 68, etc. Could criticism be more delightful? But in the London Journal, November 5, 1834, the genial essayist's fancy dallied even more daintily with the theme. A peacock with his plumage delayed, full of rainbows and starry eyes, is a fine object. But think of a lovely woman set in front of an ethereal shell and wafted about like a Venus. We are to picture to ourselves a nymph in a vest of the finest texture, and most delicate carnation. On a sudden, this drapery parts in two and flies back, stretched from head to foot like an oval fan or an umbrella, and the lady is in front of it, preparing to sweep, blushing away from us, and winnow the buxom air. For many of us, the conduct of life is becoming ever more a thing of greater perplexity. It is wearisome to be rudely jostling one another for the world's prizes while myriads are toiling round us in an Egyptian bondage unlit by one ray of sunshine from the cradle to the grave. Some have attained to Lucretian heights of philosophy, whence they look with indifference over the tossing worldwide sea of human misery. But others are fain to avert their eyes, to clean forget for a season the actual world, and lose themselves in the mazes of romance. 
In moments of despondency, there is no greater relief to a fretted spirit than to turn to the Odyssey or Mr. Payne's exquisite translation of the Arabian Nights. Great should be our gratitude to Mr. Morris for teaching us in golden verse that love is enough and for spreading wide the gates of his earthly paradise. Lucian's true history that carries us over unknown seas beyond the Atlantic bounds to enchanted islands in the West is one of those books which we do not half appreciate, and among the world's benefactors Robert Paltick deserves a place. An idle hour could not be spent in a much pleasanter way than in watching Peter Wilkins go afield with his gun or haul up the beast fish at the lonely creek. What can be more delightful than the description how, wakened from dreams of home by the noise of strange voices overhead, he sees fallen at his door the lovely winged woman, Uarki. Prudish people may be scandalized at the unreserved frankness shown in the account of the consummation of Wilkins' marriage with this fair creature. But the editor was unwilling to mutilate the book in the interests of such refined readers. A man or a woman who can find anything to shock his or her feelings in the description of Uwarki's bridal night deserves the commiseration of sensible people. Very charming is the picture of the children sitting round the fire on the long winter evenings, listening wide-eyed to the ever-fresh story of their father's marvellous adventures. The wholesome morality, the charitableness and homely piety apparent throughout, give the narrative a charm denied to many works of greater literary pretension. When Peter Wilkins leaves his solitary home to live among the winged people, the interest of the story, it must be confessed, is somewhat diminished. The author's obligations to Swift in the latter part of the book are considerable. And, of course, in describing how Peter Wilkins ordered his life on the lonely island, he was largely indebted to Defoe. But the creation of the winged beings is Paltuk's own. It has been suggested that he named his hero after John Wilkins, Bishop of Chester, who, among other curious theories, had seriously discussed the question whether men could acquire the art of flying. In the second part of his Mathematical Magic, the bishop writes, Those things that seem very difficult and fearful at the first may grow very facile after frequent trial and exercise, and therefore he that would affect anything in this kind must be brought up to the constant practice of it from his youth, trying first only to use his wings in running on the ground, as an estrich or tame geese will do, touching the earth with his toes, and so by degrees learn to rise higher, till he shall attain unto skill and confidence. I have heard it from credible testimony that one of our nation hath proceeded so far in this experiment that he was able by the help of wings to skip constantly ten yards at a time. Uwarki spread her wide grandee, and in an instant was lost in the clouds. Had the author given her the motion of a goose or even of an ostrich, <laughs> the thought is too dreadful. Judicious Reader The long winter evenings have come round, and you have now abundance of leisure. Let the poets stand idle on the shelves till the return of spring, unless perchance you would fain resume acquaintance with the seasons which you have not read since a boy or would divert yourself with prior, or be grave with crab. Now is the time to feel once more the charm of Lamb's peerless and unique essays. Now is the time to listen to the honeyed voice of Lee Hunt, discoursing daintily of men and books. So you will pass from Charles Lamb and Lee Hunt to the books they love to praise, exult in the full-blooded bracing life which pulses in the pages of Fielding, and if Smollett's mirth is occasionally too riotous and his taste too coarse, yet confess that all faults must be pardoned to the author of Humphrey Clinker. Many a long evening you will spend pleasantly with Defoe, and then perchance, after a fresh reading of the thrice and four times wonderful adventures of Robinson Crusoe, you will turn to the romance of Peter Wilkins. So, may rooms and catars be far from you, and may your hearth be crowned with content. A.H.B. 5 Willow Road, Hampstead, 
November, 1883. Dedication To the Right Honorable Elizabeth, Countess of Northumberland. Madam, Few authors, I believe, who write in my way, whatever view they may set out with, can, in the prosecution of their works, forbear to dress their fictitious characters in the real ornaments themselves have been most delighted with. This, I confess, had been my case, in the person of Uorki, in the following sheets. For having formed her body, I found myself at an inexpressible loss how to adorn her mind in the masterly sentiments I coveted to endue her with, till I recollected the most amiable pattern in your ladyship a single view of which, at a time of the utmost fatigue to his lordship, hath charmed my imagination ever since. If a participator of the cares of life in general alleviates the concerns of man, what an invaluable blessing must that lady prove to the softness of whose sex nature hath conjoined an aptitude for counsel, an application, zeal, and dispatch but too rarely found in his own. Had my situation in life been so happy as to have presented me with opportunities of more frequent and minuter remarks upon your ladyship's conduct, I might have defied the whole British fair to have outshone my southern gawry. For if to a majestic form and extensive capacity I had been qualified to have copied that natural sweetness of disposition, that maternal tenderness, that cheerfulness, that complacency, condescension, affability, and unaffected benevolence, which so apparently distinguished the Countess of Northumberland, I had exhibited in my Uorki a standard for future generations. Madam, I am the more sensible of my speaking but the truth, from the late instance of your benignity, which entitles me to the honor of subscribing myself. Madam, your ladyship's most obliged and most obedient servant, R.P. THE INTRODUCTION it might be looked upon as impertinent in me, who am about to give the life of another, to trouble the reader with any of my own concerns or the affairs that led me into the South Seas. Therefore, I shall only acquaint him that in my return on board the Hector, as a passenger round Cape Horn for England, full late in the season, the wind and currents setting strong against us, our ship drove more southerly, by several degrees, than the usual course, even to the latitude of seventy-five or seventy-six, when, the wind chopping about, we began to resume our intended way. It was about the middle of June, when the days are there at the shortest, on a very starry and moonlight night, that we observed at some distance a very black cloud, but seemingly of no extraordinary size or height, moving very fast towards us and seeming to follow the ship, which then made great way. Everyone on deck was very curious in observing its motions, and perceiving it frequently to divide, and presently to close again. And not to continue long in any determined shape, our captain, who had never before been so far to the southward as he then found himself, had many conjectures what this phenomenon might pretend. And everyone offering his own opinion, it seemed at last to be generally agreed that there might possibly be a storm gathering in the air, of which this was the prognostic, and by its following and nearly keeping pace with us, we were in great fear lest it should break upon and overwhelm us, if not carefully avoided. Our commander, therefore, as it approached nearer and nearer, ordered one of the ship's guns to be fired, to try if the percussion of the air would disperse it. This was no sooner done than we heard a prodigious flounce in the water, at but a small distance from the ship, on the weather quarter, and after a violent noise or cry in the air, the cloud, that upon our firing dissipated, seemed to return again, but by degrees disappeared. Whilst we were all very much surprised at this unexpected accident, I, being naturally very curious and inquisitive into the causes of all unusual incidents, begged the captain to send the boat to see, if possible, what it was that had fallen from the cloud, and offered myself to make one in her. He was much against this at first, as it would retard his voyage, 
Now we were going so smoothly before the wind. But in the midst of our debate, we plainly heard a voice calling out for help in our own tongue, like a person in great distress. I then insisted on going, and not suffering a fellow creature to perish for the sake of a trifling delay. In compliance with my resolute demand, he slackened the sail, and hoisting out the boat, myself and seven others made to the cry, and soon found it to come from an elderly man, laboring for life with his arms across several long poles of equal size at both ends, very light, and tied to each other in a very odd manner. The sailors at first were very fearful of assisting or coming near him, crying to each other, "'He must be a monster!' and perhaps might overset the boat and destroy them. But hearing him speak English, I was very angry with them for their foolish apprehensions, and caused them to clap their oars under him, and at length we got him into the boat. He had an extravagant beard, and also long blackish hair upon his head. As soon as he could speak, for he was almost spent, he very familiarly took me by the hand, I, having set myself close by him to observe him, and, squeezing it, thanked me very kindly for my civility to him, and likewise thanked all the sailors. I then asked him by what possible accident he came there, but he shook his head, declining to satisfy my curiosity. Hereupon, reflecting that it might just then be troublesome for him to speak, and that we should have leisure enough in our voyage for him to relate, and me to hear his story, which, from the surprising manner of his falling amongst us, I could not but believe would contain something very remarkable, I waived any farther speech with him at that time. We had him to the ship, and taking off his wet clothes, put him to bed in my cabin, and I, having a large provision of stores on board, and no concern in the ship, grew very fond of him, and supplied him with everything he wanted." In our frequent discourses together, he had several times dropped loose hints of his past transactions, which but the more inflamed me with impatience to hear the whole of them. About this time, having just begun to double the cape, our captain thought of watering at the first convenient place, and finding the stranger had no money to pay his passage, and that he had been from England no less than thirty-five years, despairing of his reward for conducting him thither, he intimated to him that he must expect to be put on shore to shift for himself when we put in for water. This entirely sunk the stranger's spirits, and gave me great concern, insomuch that I fully resolved, if the captain should really prove such a brute, to take the payment of his passage on myself. As we came nearer to the destined watering, the captain spoke the plainer of his intentions, for I had not yet hinted my design to him or anyone else and one morning the stranger came into my cabin, with tears in his eyes, telling me he verily believed the captain would be as good as his word, and set him on shore, which he very much dreaded. I did not choose to tell him immediately what I designed in his favor, but asked him if he could think of no way of satisfying the captain, or anyone else, who might thereupon be induced to engage for him, and farther, how he expected to live when he should get to England a man quite forgotten and penniless. Hereupon he told me he had, ever since his being on board, considering his destitute condition, entertained a thought of having his adventures written, which, as there was something so uncommon in them, he was sure the world would be glad to know, and he had flattered himself with hopes of raising somewhat by the sale of them to put him in a way of living." but as it was plain now he should never see England without my assistance, if I would answer for his passage and write his life, he would communicate to me a faithful narrative thereof, which he believed would pay me to the full any charge I might be at on his account. I was very well pleased with this overture, not from the prospect of gain by the copy, but from the expectation I had of being fully satisfied in what I had so long desired to know. So I told him I would make him easy in that respect. This quite transported him. He caressed me, and called me his deliverer, and was then going open-mouthed to the captain to tell him so. But I put a stop to that. For, says I, 
though I insist upon hearing your story, the captain may yet relent of his purpose and not leave you on shore. And if that should prove the case, I shall neither part with my money for you, nor you with your interest in your adventures to me. Whereupon he agreed I was right, and desisted. When we had taken in best part of our water, and the boat was going its last turn, the captain ordered up the strange man, as they called him, and told him he must go on board the boat, which was to leave him on shore with some few provisions. I, happening to hear nothing of these orders, they were so sudden the poor man was afraid, after all, he should have been hurried to land without my knowledge, but begging very hard of the captain only for leave to speak with me before he went, I was called, though with some reluctance, for the captain disliked me for the liberties I frequently took with him, on account of his brutal behavior. I expostulated with the cruel wretch on the inhumanity of the action he was about, telling him, if he had resolved the poor man should perish, it would have been better to have suffered him to do so when he was at the last extremity, than to expose him afresh by this means to a death as certain in a more lingering and miserable way. But the savage being resolved, and nothing moved by what I said, I paid him part of the passage down, and agreed to pay the rest at our arrival in England. Thus having reprieved the poor man, the next thing was to enter upon my new employ of amanuensis, and having a long space of time before us, we allotted two hours every morning for the purpose of writing down his life from his own mouth and frequently, when wind and weather kept us below, we spent some time of an afternoon in the same exercise till we had quite completed it. But then there were some things in it so indescribable by words that if I had not had some knowledge in drawing, our history had been very incomplete. Thus it must have been, especially in the description of the glums and gauries therein mentioned. In order to gain, that so I might communicate, a clear idea of these, I made several drawings of them from his discourses and accounts, and at length, after diverse trials, I made such exact delineations that he declared they could not have been more perfect resemblances if I had drawn them from the life. Upon a survey, he confessed the very persons themselves could not have been more exact. I also drew with my pencil the figure of an aerial engagement, which, having likewise had his approbation, I have given a draft of Plate the Sixth. Then, having finished the work to our mutual satisfaction, I locked it up, in order to peruse it at leisure, intending to have presented it to him at our arrival in England, to dispose of as he pleased, in such a way as might have conduced most to his profit. For I resolved, notwithstanding our agreement, and the obligations he was under to me, that the whole of that should be his own. But he, having been in a declining state some time before we reached the shore, died the very night we landed, and his funeral falling upon me, I thought I had the greatest right to the manuscript, which, however, I had no design to have parted with. But showing it to some judicious friends, I have by them been prevailed with not to conceal from the world what may prove so very entertaining and perhaps useful. R. P. End of Preface, Dedication and Introduction